Good evening. The open meeting in the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's order of March 12, 2020, due to the COVID virus, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public body of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet remotely as long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to tarabradley at town.arlington.ma.us. This meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is convening by Zoom app a video conference as posted on the town's website. Um, please note that the meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public's encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Now we'll turn to the uh, first item on the agenda. The chair will introduce each speaker and they will conclude, after they conclude their remarks, and I will reemphasize this, the chair will invite members to provide comments and questions or motions. Please hold until you're recognized your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking and please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, wait until the chair leaves the, yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Uh, due to the size of my laptop screen, I may not be able to see all the members. So again, I'm asking that Tara Bradley or any of the court bring attention, any raised hand that I haven't noticed. Finally, uh, each vote in the me meeting will be conducted by roll call. So now I'll take the attendance and members when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative if you are present. Um, Grant Gibbion. Here. Shane Blundell. Here. John Ellis. Here. Kaya Healy. Here. Brian Beck. Here. Arif Padaria. Sophie Migliato. Here. Jonathan Wallach. Here. Shailene Crawford. Here. Daryl Harmer. Here. Andy LaCourt. Here. Alan Jones. Here. George Coaster. Here. Bill Keller. Here. Al Tassi. Here. Wanda Nascimento. Here. Christine Deschler's not here. Dean Carmen. Here. And David McKenna. Here. Tara Bradley as our executive secretary. Here. Thank you very much. So we will now um, move to the uh, first. Um, so I wanted to make some comments before we go to the minutes. Um, so uh, tonight we're going to address several Warren articles. Uh, next Monday night, uh, I hope that we can deal with all the Warren articles that require a recommendation in our and have not required a, a scheduled hearing. So please review the, uh, the integrated schedule which Tara has put up on the Finance Committee SharePoint site. So you can, which articles uh, will, be, will be handled and uh, what the amounts are that we're looking for. And normally that's gonna be last year's, um, last year's amount. Um, we talked about this a, a, some weeks ago but I've sent an, an email to Doug Heim and Sandy Pooler asking about the whereabouts of a draft warrant for the special town meeting. Um, the, the main issue is that we require a special town meeting to transfer the student growth factor of probably over a million dollars that's, that's in the reserve fund, which wasn't used in fiscal 22. This has to be stabilized, I mean, uh, transferred to the override stabilization fund. 
This has to happen prior to June 30th. So it can't take place during the regular um, town, uh, annual town meeting. And it has to be in a special town meeting. There also may be a comp article, which uh, David and Sophie brought to my attention. And um, we, we may have that on uh, Monday's agenda as well. So uh, on these Warren articles, I'd like to follow pretty strictly a, a procedure that I hope will maintain some efficiency. Um, when we have a hearing, we'll hear the presentation from the proponents or opponents uh, requested a place on the agenda. Please hold your questions until after the presentations. In other words, let's not be interrupting the speakers with uh, questions. Following the presentations by the guest speakers, I'll open up the floor for questions or comments from the members whom I have to wait until they recognize before speaking. Following questions and comments from the members, I will then ask for a motion on the warrant in a second. Um, <clears throat> at that point, I'll ask for additional discussion. And if there's a different view about what the vote should be on the Warren article, this would be the time for members to make a substitute motion or an amendment, which will also need to be seconded. And if there are substitute motions or amendments, uh, I'll allow debate on the substitute motion and amendments uh, until we have exhausted our creative thinking. Um, following this further discussion, <clears throat> we will take a vote to clear the various motions in the Warren article and then take a final vote uh, as the uh, as the motions uh, have have determined, Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So now um, I'd like to uh, turn to the minutes, approving the minutes. Uh, Tara, could you uh, display the minutes as amended? Uh, uh, yes. Um, so here are the minutes for um, the three nine uh, last week. This was when we had um, Sandy Pooler and, and Ida Cody come in about the revolving fund for the private way and the Community Preservation Act Committee come in. Um, I have not received comments, but I did um, wanna bring folks attention to, um, I guess this, uh, this language here, which is sort of us, uh, for you all, um, approving or, or I guess endorsing the budget, but um, with the caveat that the numbers would be varying slightly. Um, and so that information did come back in from Julie Wayman after the fact. Um, and you can kind of see the difference um, in the budgets here by a couple of thousand dollars down there. Are there any questions on the minutes from uh, March 9th? So I think I think a motion uh, is in order to approve the minutes. Move we accept. Yeah. Okay. Then moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll take a roll call on the minutes of uh, March 9th. Grant Gibeon. Yes. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Kaya Healy. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Arif Padaria. Not here. Sophie McGlazo. Yes. 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 Jonathan Wallach. Jonathan Wallach is here. Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Uh, uh, Charlie, I am I was absent, so I'm abstaining. Abstaining. OK. Thank you. Um, Shailene Crawford. Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Altasi? Yes. Juan de Nascimento? Yes. Chris, um, Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. Thank you. Um, it, uh, all the votes were in favor. There was one abstention. Okay, um, our, our guest here. Um, so we have um, Paul Schlittman here. Um, however, we do not yet have uh, Jenny Rate from the planning department um, and she 
Um, they're not scheduled to start until 7.50, so it's right. possible she'll be joining the next 10 minutes or so. Is she speaking on uh, or, or on Article 20? She is not, but um, we were hoping for her to be here um, because she anticipates uh, the, the Warren article affecting the uh, budget of her department. Um, she, she mentioned that there is not currently personnel capacity um, who would be able to- Okay, well, look, let's not debate it, uh, Tara. Um, okay. So, Paul Schlickman, are you here? I yes, am here. Yes, Good yes. evening. Good evening, Paul. So uh, please proceed and um, present your um, thoughts on Warren number 20. And let me ask a question. Do you have it in a uh, in the form of the vote that you want to see before town meeting? Uh, no, no, I don't. Not at this point. Um, <clears throat> I was looking for some guidance from the select board, which uh, didn't prove to be the most helpful thing, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, may I uh, share my screen? Yes, but let me advise you that um, we may we may listen to you and debate it, but I'm not sure if it's not, if it's not in. A, I mean, I don't know exactly the ins and outs of what you're proposing, but if it's not in a form that is approved by the um, town council for presentation to town meeting, we may not vote it. Okay. Uh, uh, I just want to we know that Jenny may not, not vote it either way. I, I appreciate the finance committee's uh, uh, role in this process. Uh, let me just leave it at that. Yeah, I think your screen is shareable. Okay, let's see. And Paul, we appreciate your coming tonight. I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's, it's nice to be with friends. Um, Though it's, uh, ba, 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 ba. I'm trying to get it to share. I'm not seeing the document I'm looking to share. So, have, have you opened it? Yeah, I have. I, I, I I'm in. I, I'm getting a bunch of asterisks and, and nothing else. So, what? What? I, I, I can let me, talk. Let me make a suggestion. Hang on one minute. Sure. Uh, Tara, do you have a uh, Paul's presentation? Uh, yes, I do. Can let you, me let me pull that up. Throw it up on the screen, and then Paul, you can just ask to have the pages changed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that that'd be great. That would be great. And and maybe Tara, could you make it expand it? Yeah, that's the idea. Right. So so here's the gist of what I'm trying to do. The, the the vote would be to see if the town will vote to grant enforcement power to a code enforcement officer in the Department of Planning and Community Development for the purpose of enforcing provisions of the town bylaws and zoning bylaws do not pertain to building standards or take any action related thereto. That's that that's the article. So my intent was not to force something into the budget. My intent was to amend the bylaws so that if in the wisdom of town meeting and of course the recommendation of the finance committee, which would be uh, super helpful, a position were to wander into the budget to do this or uh in the alternative to have uh the or director of planning and community development designate herself or any of her employment or employees as a code enforcement officer for the purposes of enforcing the bylaws uh if you could scroll to the top of the second page i want to go through some examples of, of problems we have as you're aware, and as you sat through town meeting on many occasions, um, we don't have bylaws and zoning bylaws. We really have a compendium of municipal suggestions in that we do not enforce these bylaws. 
And I want to point, first of all, to the one that gets brought up in town meeting on several occasions, almost annually, that we look at the bylaw, the zoning bylaw pertaining to signs. Uh, and window signs are restricted to 25% of the area in the window where they're displayed. Now, every year at town meeting, when we've been in person, just point across the street, look over there, look at Gentle Dental, if you would scroll down to the Gentle Dental sign, look at Gentle Dental, and they're certainly out of compliance with the bylaw. Why is it as a town that we cannot find a way to look across the street from town hall and see a blatant violation of the sign by law, which has existed now for more than 10 years. And the answer is usually hem, haw, hem, haw, that's not a priority. And at the last town meeting, we heard from the director of inspectional services is we really don't do that. Um, and so we need some sort of a way to look at the bylaws and zoning bylaws uh, and, and find some mechanism to enforce these things. And I went looking for places that do it well. And as it turns out, Fort Worth, Texas does it well. And, and they divide the enforcement into two things. One is the building structural safety, which the building department and the building instructor really feels is their priority and that's the stuff they want to do and then there's the signs and quality of life things that do not affect the, uh, the safety of a building structure uh, but does violate the bylaws and, and impacts the quality of life in town so my solution to this problem after years and years and years and years and years, and years of standing in town meeting and saying well why aren't we enforcing the bylaws and looking across the street at violations that, uh, to look for this mechanism is to provide someone in the Department of uh, Planning and Community Development, which really cares about the zoning bylaws and the quality of life stuff and designate that person with enforcement powers. So basically the gist of what I'm saying is we need some provision in the bylaw that will provide enforcement for somebody who's not the building inspector because the building inspector wants nothing to do with this. Sort of like the reason why we create parking enforcement agents as opposed to police officers, because police officers want to fight crime, not write parking tickets. <clears throat> and, and that's the thinking behind this. And if we can scroll down a little further, I'm, I'm not p picking on gentle dental just because they happen to be convenient and invisible. This is a problem that is sprouting throughout town and the town is doing nothing about it. This is the liquor store up in Arlington Heights, which is clearly covering their windows. It's more than 25% as well. And my attitude, and I think that many of you will agree with me, is that we're spending time in town meeting. We're debating the finer points of bylaws. We're looking to dot I's, cross T's, tweak, amend, and get it just right coming out of town meeting only for these bylaws to be ignored. And this is not a good thing. If we don't want to enforce the bylaws, if it's the will of the legislature not to enforce these bylaws, we should get rid of the bylaw and let people do what they want. We shouldn't have bylaws we're not willing to enforce. And that's what I'm trying to do. Now, if somebody wanted to go in addition to amending the bylaws to provide a provision to allow enforcement uh, an enforcement officer to be hired and it shouldn't be a, a full-time position it's probably a point two or something very minor um, i mean that that's up to the administration and the finance committee and ultimately the wisdom of town meeting but I, I want to remove this barrier from enforcement and provide a mechanism in a place in the bylaws that will enable a uh, enable these things to be enforced. And that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm just going to give me a second. I wanted to.
So looking at the warrant as I see it written here, and I'm just I'm just saying doing this to give some instructions to the committee and 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 Paul to you. Um, so this is there is no appropriation in Article 20. Okay, so um, the I I think that the position of the finance committee that the, the position of the finance committee is in um, is to um, if they if they have no opinion or support you to do nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we find out from a department that there's an extra cost associated with this, the finance committee may decide to oppose it. So I, I just advise you, since there's no appropriation money, not even a dollar in here, there's, there's not too much, this is a, a board of selectmen article. So uh, with that comment, um, let me, turn the meeting. If you're finished, Paul, we'll see if people have any questions or comments, okay? Oh, sure, yeah. So, are there any questions? Yes, Alan Jones. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Paul, so I don't have to drag myself through the signage bylaws. Uh, is there a financial penalty uh, for violations of these? Yes. It, is there a way that we that you think this could possibly be done in a revenue neutral way? Maybe something like parking meters? I, I would think you know the, the select board was making an argument that it's difficult to collect fines. Uh, I, I wasn't particularly buying that. Uh, but one would uh, hypothesize that if we've got fines in the bylaw for violations and we're paying somebody to find violations, um, it, it should be revenue neutral or even maybe revenue positive. That'd be good. I mean, I. I tend to agree with you about the aesthetic problem and, and just uh, ignoring the uh, the bylaw, but it'd be great to, if we could do it in a relative neutral or positive way. Thank you. Is there any, uh, yes, um, Shailene. Hi, um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Paul, could you clarify whether you are, um, I see that the warrant, and I realize this isn't the final wording, but as it's in front of us, is asking to grant enforcement to a code enforcement officer. So could you clarify that, that there are, currently is no such thing as a code enforcement officer, if that's correct. And then uh, you're planning to suggest it in the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, would that require a change to, I think this is similar to Alan's question. I'm just wondering if that would then mean there would need to be money in the budget of that department to, even if it was like a, a point two FTE, which still sounds high to me. Um, where would that money come from? So like, is this a new position? Which department and where would the money come from? Uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm saying that if the town in its wisdom wants to create the position, they could. But right now, there's if, if they were to create the position, there's no mechanism for that person to be legally allowed under our bylaws to do the enforcement. Um, you can designate current employees do also have the power of enforcement to the point where somebody in planning and community development could, in theory, just take a couple of photos and send a certified letter to the uh, owner of record, which shouldn't be too terribly expensive. Um, some might require more thought. And I didn't want to get into the minutia of telling the town how to run its business. But I did look at this as a problem to be solved in that the building department has absolutely no interest in in enforcing uh the bylaws uh the zoning bylaws the quality of life things uh, and how do we get around this how do we get these bylaws enforced uh i look for the department where people care about it the most community development and decided to find a way to prevent uh, present a mechanism that if the town meeting and the town administration uh, so chose with the blessing of the finance committee uh, could either designate people within that department or add a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or a fractional position, split a position, do something that, that meets their needs uh, in order to do the enforcement. 
Okay, I can't. So yeah, I can't. Not, I can't. This is not proposing that how it gets paid for. This current warrant article is not mm. proposing the money side of things. Is that exactly? Better. Exactly. My my goal was to create the structure from which we could drop a position into the budget if we so chose, or through any other mechanism to designate somebody within that department as having enforcement authority. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sophie. Yes, thank you. Um, have you had any discussions with the legal department? And uh, you mentioned register, you know, certified letters. If, if um, businesses don't just pay the fine and fix the problem, I'm assuming the legal department that's going to add to their workload. Are they going to be able to take this on? I, I that that discussion I haven't had. I had discussion with the legal department in terms of drafting the original article, and it conforms to what we're allowed to do under. Um, uh, under the rules of town meeting, we are allowed to amend the bylaws to create this uh, enforcement authority. Dean Carmen. You're mute, Dean. Because I lowered my hand and started talking. Um, that wasn't, <laughs> it's not helpful. <laughs> um, so, Paul, just so I understand what's going to eventually be your proposed article. So you're if I tell me if I have this right, you're, you're proposing to give the town the authority. They're to your you're proposing to grant them enforcement power to create a code enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. But the article actually doesn't require them to have one. Correct. So, like, they could get the power on. October one and be like, we don't want to fill the position. True. Yeah. I mean, I don't think town meeting has the power to force this position onto the town. Maybe we do, but I didn't want to go there. Uh, I just wanted to set up the structure for so that it could happen. And if we came back to town meeting in 2023 and still found the same signs up on gentle dental, uh, we, we could have a different conversation. Thank you. Jane Blundell. Thanks, Charlie. Um, thanks, Paul. Good to see you. Um, I guess just what and I understand this is evolving, but it says uh, any provision that does not pertain to building standards. I mean, do you have any, aside from like the sign bylaws, do you have any sense of like other bylaws that you envision? And I guess like maybe more of a comment, but like, you know, like we've been through a pandemic, right? Like we're, you know, these are local businesses. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's good to have standards and guidelines, but also like, is there a way to like work with the businesses too, to like, you know, we have a sort of a main street, a downtown, we want it like a commercial sector. We want people walking around, like, I guess, well, how much power do you envision? What sort of other sort of codes or enforcement should we be doing and is there a way to like maybe get some buy-in from like our local businesses who might be subject you know might be getting fines from a such code enforcement officer uh code compliance tends to be on a lot of things it, it could include in the picture was in the presentation uh failure to remove snow from the sidewalk uh it can be people parking commercial vehicles in, the, in their front yards. Uh, those kinds of things that we have put into the zoning bylaw and the bylaw uh, as quality of life things that don't involve structural safety, in other words, the building code. And the, the bylaws are full of these things. Now, for the most part, they aren't big issues, uh, but the, the thing is, is if we're willing, it, as a former principal and as a school administrator, I look at this, it, it, it's chaos and it breeds total disrespect for the bylaws when we pass things and somehow in the process between the legislature and reality, somebody is making a decision, Now nah, we're not going to enforce this. It's giving town employees a veto power that they shouldn't have. Grant Gibbon. You're mute. There you go. Thank, uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, 
Paul, a uh, very good job on the um, uh, thoughtful approach to the um, to address the situation. Um, do you? This is sort of a you know an opinion question, but do you think that the Gentle Dental is aware that they're not in compliance? Well, I haven't go, gone and knocked on their door and told them that, but certainly it is popped up in the local news. It's been in the Advocate, it's been in your Arlington. So if they Google themselves, they, they've probably have, have seen mention of this in the past. Now, whether somebody from the town has gone by and said, hey, you know, guys, you got a sign problem. Uh, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Grant. Are there any other questions? Annie. So, Paul, what makes you assume that the building inspector doesn't want to enforce these codes and that it's not a, a personnel issue there? Uh, what he said in town meeting last year. Can you can you remind me of exactly what he said and why you interpreted it as him saying he doesn't care? Uh, he basically said, no, nah, we, we don't. Uh, I asked and he, uh, and he went through this whole thing of priorities and buildings and such, even in the context of budgets where the inspectional services have had cuts. And we've asked, do you have the staffing required to do the job? The answer back is yes, even though they, they've lost the point two or point three here and there. And, and then somebody else came in in a follow up and said, well, do you do this? He said, no, we don't. We're not going to. Basically, that was the response. We're going to we're going to focus on on structural. OK, and and that was our previous building inspector, correct? Uh, that was the director of inspectional services last year, correct? Right. And we have a new director of inspectional services. So let me just ask you a quick follow on question. So it, it is frequently the case that in town meeting, we've got these kinds of bylaws, not necessarily these signed bylaws, because I think they've been here for a long time, but other bylaws that you have mentioned. We vote these bylaws, we put them in the code, we ask at the time the department heads who are there what they will do about them, and they all say pretty much the same thing. We will respond when we get complaints. That's all we have the capacity to do. So I'm, I'm skeptical and, you know, it's probably not our article because there's no appropriation, but I'm skeptical that this will work um, unless you have a code enforcement officer who's not just a point two, but someone who's trolling the town every day, all day looking for violations because they are not going to otherwise receive those violations except via complaint. And presumably now, if somebody complains, somebody is required to follow up that complaint. Like, do we have any data to back up the idea that complaints are not being handled? Um, I know that people have complained about the liquor store. I know that the, there have been complaints on General Dental. I know there have been complaints about other bylaws that have, have just not been addressed. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let, let's not forget and, one, one other thing. Uh, we're only five square miles. Paul, uh, Paul, Paul. Paul. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we know how big we are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Annie, did you have any other questions? Six. Take your hand down, please. Thank you. Uh, David McKenna. Uh, thank you, Charlie. I, um, I just want to remind everybody, one of the problems with these bylaws, uh, when they come up at town meeting and they're voted uh, in favorable action, that they're not, a lot of them are not thought out completely. It, it's uh, kind of a direct reaction to, to somebody that has a concern. I'll give you an example. We have a town bylaw that prohibits bud, bud, bud zappers, you know, the things that kill mosquitoes in the backyard. We, we have a bylaw that was put into effect and the enforcement of that bylaw was given to the build inspector. The only problem is the bylaw is only in effect at night and build inspectors do not work at night. So that went on by the boards. I can name bylaw after bylaw that has well intended, but it, it, it becomes the same thing. Some of them are unenforceable. We all talk about the snow removal. 
if you read the snow removal bylaw and what, what it prohibits and, and, and all the actions, you have to locate the owner of the property, not somebody that occupies the property, but the owner of the property. And then there's, a restri there's exceptions to the rule if uh, they're elderly, senior citizens. Now the police have the enforcement of that. So there's different departments that have supposedly jurisdiction or enforcement, if you will, for certain bylaws. Um, from the get-go, I would advise town meeting members if in the future, when a bylaw such as this bylaw we're discussing tonight comes up, that it's fully thought out on really who's going to have the enforcement right from the get-go. Now we have a bylaw, as Paul mentions, that's really unenforceable until we designate someone somewhere to be responsible. Um, but in these bylaws, you have to be careful because there's all kinds of um, restrictions and, and, and considerations for, for different meanings. And, and the question becomes, what about somebody that, that David, in violation David, think, of this? I think, David, I I'm sorry. To, to, I just, I just uh, want to finish my point, Charlie. Okay. What if somebody that, somebody that wants to have this bylaw doesn't want to pay it? Then it goes back to Sophie's concern about the legal department and all what happens after that. So again, my point is we have to think about these bylaws before we vote them and put them into some type of action. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, any, any further questions on this uh, presentation? So um, I, I note that it, it specifically um, refers to the enforcement officer being in the Department of Planning and Community Development. And I think um, the director of the Department of Planning and Community Development at our meeting. And I think, I think it would be appropriate to ask her if she would speak uh, as to what she thinks this means in terms of financial impact to her department. Uh, Jenny Raid, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'm Jenny Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. Good evening. I have not spoken with Mr. Sh Mr. Schlickman about this article, so I'm learning about uh, learning a little bit more about it tonight as well. Um, but we do not have the position of a code enforcement officer in the department right now, so this would, in essence, be a bit of an unfunded maybe not a requirement or mandate, but it would certainly not be something that our current staff have the capacity to do, nor do we currently do at all. Um, so it would come with eventually, you know, potentially creating a new position, which is what it says right here on the screen in the department, which would mean a new job description, a new uh, process for hiring somebody to actually perform the work as outlined. The goals of the position, I think, are laudable. Um, but the exact description of what they're actually enforcing is a little bit unclear to me. It's also unclear to me how this person intersects with other enforcement officers in town, which are outlined in the town bylaws, um, as well as that of the director of inspectional services. Since there are multiple bylaws that are enforced by different departments, the fire department, the police department, the health and human services department, um, as well as inspectional services and the, de the Department of Public Works even. So it would require a new position to be added. My current budget could not accommodate this particular uh, position or any portion of it at this moment in time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Jenny. Uh, any further questions uh, for Mr. Schlickman or for Ms. Raid? So uh, as I said earlier, uh, and I thank, uh, thank you, Paul, for your presentation, and Jenny, I thank you for your comments. As I said earlier, uh, there's no appropriation in this article, so we don't have a, um, uh, a dog in that hunt, so to speak. We have only, um, I think, one, two options here. One is to take a vote to do nothing about this article, just let it, let it sit, and whatever happens at the town meeting happens. Or uh, the other is uh, to vote uh, that we recommend against it because we think it has a financial impact on the budget. So, um, and I'm open to any comments on those alternative uh, positions. Uh, Dean Carmen. So I would like to make a motion and then I would like to explain why I'm making it. Please go ahead. Okay, so I move that we um, 
thank Mr. Schlickman and Ms. Wright for the time that they spent with us tonight and their contributions to our meeting. And then we um, move to do nothing with it and let the select board deal with it at town meeting. Does there a second? <laughs> Does, is there a second? Second. Yeah. Seconded by Jonathan Wallach. Okay, good. Jonathan, did you want to comment or you just wanted to second the motion? I just lowered my hand because uh, Dean Dean's taking care of me. <laughs> I think, you know, Christine usually beats me. So okay. tonight was my mom. Let's stay under control here. Any further questions or uh, comments or discussion on um, on this article? I don't see any. Okay. So uh, I'm going to move for a vote. It's moved and seconded. Uh, moved by uh, Dean Carmen. Uh, article 20. Um, I'm just going to call it no action. Okay. Uh, Grant Gibbian. Yes. Oh, wait, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So it's not no action. It's no, 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 no action by the finance committee. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, put it in a formal term. Do nothing sounds a little bit irresponsible. You know? How about no <laughs> position? No, no position. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no position. I, a better. Um, okay. Um, uh, that Dean changes Blundell. everything. I vote yes. <laughs> Does that change? Yes, Shane. I just, I, I just have a, a point. No, Ryan, we 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 moved on. We're taking no, no, vote. But I just want to understand what no position meant. That's all. That is that is a, it's not a finance committee article. Okay, that's all I want to know. Yeah, um, John Ellis. Yes, to the motion. Thank you. Micaiah Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Uh, Arif's not here. Sophie? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Kayleen? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Uh, Andy LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tasti. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. So the vote is unanimous that this is um, not a finance committee article and we'll take no position on it. So um, Paul, thank you very much for coming tonight. And um, I, think, I think you heard a, a lot of generally supportive uh, uh, comments about your concerns, but I think uh, people are also nervous about the structure of the article and, and what it what it can mean, and the fact that it financially uh, have a financial cost to the town. Uh, thank you. I, you know, when when I wrote this, I didn't anticipate it having uh, a finance committee vote for the structure, and I'm very grateful for the chance to just sort of explain it to you and appreciative of your thoughts. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you. The next um, Warren article is Warren Article 60, Blue Bikes. Um, Director Rate. I hope she's still here. There she is. <clears throat> I'm still here. Thank you. Um, Jenny Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. I'm also joined by my colleague, Daniel Amstutz, who is the Senior Transportation Planner. Dan, just say hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, all right, good evening again, everybody. So this is a, an appropriation request. We actually had initially, I had initially proposed this as a capital planning request, but it was um, unfortunately the capital planning committee decided that operations and maintenance were not squarely under capital planning. So it indeed became an appropriation request as a separate warrant article, which is what you see before you now. And I'll give you a little bit of history. We've been, a part of the Blue Bikes Regional Bike Share Program for, uh, we're in the middle of, a, we're in a two-year contract right now that began in 2020. We have six, what are called docking stations. They're basically a, a place where all the bikes are parked. And there are six stations with 38 bikes total. In the last year, there were 10,000 rides, just to give you a sense of, of riderships and users. Um, Arlington is actually one of five additional municipalities that are added on to what was sort of the original four 
core communities that operated uh, the bike share system, which used to be called Hubway. It's gone through some iterations. Um, so as I said, we joined a uh, couple of years ago. We're still in the midst of that contract. We're hoping to re-up that contract for another two years, but the $100,000 in special appropriation request is for that next two years worth of operations and maintenance, which is not currently covered by any grant funding or prior capital planning funding that is currently in the system or will be part of the future capital planning. So there is also still a, a request in capital planning just for blue bike stations, not operations and maintenance. There's bikes and operations and maintenance. Sorry, my hands are telling you a story, but I hope that it's clear. Um, it's important to fund the operations and maintenance because we anticipate that we will sign on to that two-year contract with blue bikes. The operator is Lyft, as in the car you know, ride share program. Lift, uh, they do business as Motivate. So our contract technically is with Motivate currently. We anticipate that we will sign on to that in August. And this funding would actually allow us to fulfill our obligations for that next contract. So the funding also would allow us to make a modest expansion to the blue bike system in Arlington, which would include places in Arlington Heights, um, which we heard quite a deal about needing to expand the program, offer more bikes, and particularly provided in locations where we're not currently serving in the community. So Arlington Heights, and be able to leverage federal funding from the Community Connections Program that we have already received in the past. So we would not be able to expand the system, however, without ensuring that future operations and maintenance costs are covered, which again, they are not right now. The funding that we're asking for allows us to fulfill goals that are also part of our Connect Arlington long range transportation plan, as well as the master plan. And we're hoping that we would be able to stretch this funding as far as possible to eliminate costs like what we call winter storage. It's basically moving the docks off of the street so that the Department of Public Works can um, you know, do their plowing operations on street. Um, so hopefully eliminating that and any other unnecessary station relocations by finding locations for the docks that are off street. Um, and we would not expect to come back for additional funding requests for at least another two years. And hopefully by that time, we will also be able to explore some sponsorships and other sort of more creative funding opportunities so that we wouldn't have to come back at all. But in the meantime, the request is for $100,000 in order to cover the operations and maintenance. So. I would be glad, as well as Dan Amstutz, would be glad to answer your questions about this request, and I appreciate the time very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. Uh, Bill Keller, you have your hand up? You're muted. Take two. Thank you, Jennifer. It was a very nice presentation. I recall a lot of these points that were made back in uh, 2020. Um, I guess one question I would have would just be, even though there may not be a direct offset per se, how much revenue was raised for the 10,000 rides you mentioned? I'm going to see if Dan can jump in with them. Um, so Dan actually sits on this uh, committee of other municipalities with the original municipalities, attends their regular meetings, and he is essentially our point person for the contract that Arlington has with Lyft or motivate rather. So Dan, do you want to take a stab at that? I can, I can take a stab. Um, essentially, the current contract that we have with Lyft is that Lyft is receiving all of that revenue that is actually coming from those uh, people buying the day passes or the annual passes or so on for the station. Um, but sort of in return, we have not had to pay any operations and maintenance fees for this two year period. Um, and they were the part of that contract was to see if we were able to get to a certain point with the number of trips uh, over these two years to see if they could sort of break even in a way. And we're, we're almost there, but it's, it's unlikely that we will be able to get there. Um, so the rest, so the, the revenue is really being plowed back into the system. Um, and being, um, you know, used to offset the costs of operating, operating and maintaining the system, along with the sponsorships that uh, they get from the Blue Bikes, uh, or sorry, from not from Blue Bikes, but from Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the title sponsorship of the program. Okay, thank you. Grant Gibbion. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you had mentioned um, um, exploring in the future, exploring any uh, sponsorships. Um, are you currently exploring any sponsorships? And then when I mean sponsorships, I think this is more kind of related maybe to what Bill was saying is that uh, money that comes into the town directly. I'm gonna start that off and then I'll hand it over to Dan to finish up. Um, as we have been more recently exploring the idea of, of sponsorships, we have not needed to, but now looking into the future, we are going to be looking at that. We haven't needed to because we had a grant covering the cost of the, of the contract. And then we also had the capital planning money. We haven't needed to explore other funding resources. The other funding resources that we typically go to would be through the state, um, as mentioned, through that community connections grant, but it won't cover uh, these operations and maintenance costs. The other thing is the additional municipalities never had a requirement to raise funds through sponsorships. And sponsorships, by the way, is like a business sponsoring a docking station, just to give you a, like some perspective of what we're talking about. <clears throat> so it could mean, you know, for potentially advertising um, or other offsetting other costs like operations and maintenance. We currently haven't had that structure, but we are exploring it. And Dan has looked into sort of the framework for what might be required for that. And we do have a sense of the kinds of businesses that we would potentially go to, to ask for you know, that type of sponsorship. Dan, could you just very briefly talk about what that sponsorship model entails, please? Sure, and there've been, um, I think Jenny mentioned there's, a few other municipalities, uh, specifically Newton, Chelsea, Revere, and Watertown that we've been working with very closely because we all entered the system at the same time, about 2020, after the other major municipalities. Um, but there's ways that businesses can sponsor a station, uh, either the operations of that station uh, or the purchase of a new station, which uh, they've done in like Boston and Cambridge and Somerville. Um, it's sort of a popular way to get into the system, have something like at your development and also to um, offset some of their like transportation demand management. So uh, the other thing I'll just briefly mention about sponsorships is that um, the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield was able to extend some sponsorship money to our communities um, to help cover some of these costs, but it's not going to be enough. And it's kind of split between six different communities that have entered the system, again, after the sort of core four, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, and Brookline have been in, uh, in the system. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Grant, is your hand down or up? Uh, it's still up. Actually, it, it sort of leads to another question, but I wanted to wait for you to, to ask. Thank you. Um, so if we re has Arlington received any money from Blue Cross Blue Shield? No, we haven't received money directly from any title sponsor. That only goes to those four original municipalities. Um, and it's, you know, it's not currently part of our, our current two-year contract. As Dan noted, some of it spreads out from that title sponsor, but not we would need to find other types of sponsorships if we sh if we chose to in the future. Okay, one one final question: um, Is there any gen general or large scale plan, business plan, back of the envelope plan, high level projection about the sponsorships and that they could cover, let's say? 100,000 or whatever the gap is from the grants. Um, and to make up for that, we're not getting any Blue Cross Blue Shield sponsorship money that other communities. Is there any high level plan or, I mean, I understand you're discussing ideas and stuff and I think that's great, but it, I'm wondering if there's anything in place now that you're working toward any strategy or high level goals or something you, you plan that you're looking at. I think high level, yes, we have certainly explored some options. It would not offset all of that 100, you know, what's included in this appropriations request because some of that appropriations request we can knock down by changing our winter operations and changing the location of the docking stations, which we hope we can do anyway, but like regardless. 
Um, the other part is related to increasing ridership. And if we can meet some of those ridership goals, again, we may not need a full sponsorship or offset from a sponsorship. So I think just, yes, theoretically at, at a high level, your, your way of putting it, um, at a high level, yes, we have talked about it. So I'm sorry, then one more question. So um, it sounded like there was, if you, it sounded to me like if you increase ridership, we get more money, but I don't understand where we get more money from if we're not getting any now. Is that gonna be negotiated in the future? Dan, will you clarify that, the, uh, what you were talking about before about the increase in ridership? Uh, sure. And how, so it's tied to, and how it's tied to money, our money, Arlington money. The Arlington. Well, yeah, it, the, sure. not under the current contract necessarily, but yeah. Sure. So, well, I guess to clarify, there's a provision under the current contract contract that if we meet a certain number of rides that we can continue the existing contract as is to essentially not have to pay for operations and maintenance. But it is very unlikely that we will actually reach that number and none of the other communities that have been added on, including Newton and Watertown, Revere and Chelsea have been able to reach that number. Um, so this is where we've we've come into um, and we, we we were unsure um, and we tried to push against having this in the contract, but um, it was something that was that, that was put in by uh, Lyft, the, the operator. We have negotiated with them, you know, additionally uh, over the last several months to try to get some sort of tiering of of uh, if we get enough rides that maybe the cost goes down. Um, or that it's sort of tiered based on how many rides we have right now. So it's not, it's tied to money in the sense of um, reducing the costs that we would have to pay. And we have come to an agreement that um, if ba basically there, there is a tiering structure where if we reach a certain number of rides that we can get the monthly cost for that specific month lowered by a certain amount. Um, it's not a whole lot, but it, it can make a difference. Um, but because of the sort of undulations of the ridership over the period of, you know, over the year, um, we'd probably only meet that, you know, get a discount on that three or four months out of the year. All right, well, your questions. Th th thank you very much. Uh, and answering that, it's a uh, interesting negotiate, must be tr tricky negotiating with and to trying to get them in. Maybe in the future, you know, they might, they, they're understanding that if they didn't have Arlington in the contract, they would be out 10,000 or 100,000 or whatever many Grant, rides. Let's, let's just keep it to questions. Yeah. To the, Very uh, good. Thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annie LaCourt, you're mute. Yes. No, no, I'm coming. I have two quick questions. One is, do we have any uh, realistic ability to tie those 10,000 rides to an environmental impact? number of cars, car trips not taken, number of cars not registered in town or anything along those lines? It's okay to say no. I'm not sure I could immediately answer that, but I think that it's something that we can explore how, what that environmental impact has been. Uh, the information that we received from Lyft is somewhat limited, but Dan's got his hand raised, so I'll let him. <laughs> see what he has uh, to say about this more broadly. Sure, so um, the funding that, um, so the funding that we have, the grants from the Community Connections, which is a regional transportation grant that um, we have, we, we actually have received that already and we can use it to expand the system. We're just sort of trying to figure out how many stations we can actually expand by. That money is from a program called the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program. Uh, it's a federal transportation program to, you know, try to reduce congestion and, increase and improve air quality. And as part of that application, I think you have to be able to show a um, a carbon uh, a benefit or like an air quality benefit. And so there was a calculation. I believe that was done for that application that I could probably dig up to get. So it's more of an estimation based on like, okay, you, you're adding so many stations, you're adding so many rides. Uh, and it's also, it was done in conjunction with um, 
Revere. Uh, no, not Revere. I'm sorry. Chelsea. Okay, Dan, let's keep it uh, just so yeah. answering the question. Annie, you have yes. this? No, I ha just have um, uh, one additional comment, which is that I, I want to be sure that I understand how the money works. So the contract with Lyft has a certain number of rides in it because people are paying per ride and Lyft needs to make a certain amount of money in order to cover their costs, correct? And so the reason that we owe money as part of this contract is that if we don't get up over those rides, they're not breaking even or making enough of a profit that they don't need that contribution. Is that a correct description of how the contract financing works? And can you describe that? But I believe yes, Broad, oh. broadly yes. But there's some, you know, components to this that if we shared the entire budget, we could give you a little more of the sort of nuance, the details so, back and forth. So maybe what you want to do, Jenny, rather than um, you know take a lot of time right now, is forward that to us with maybe an explanation. We can do um, that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I understand the funding model and I think I understand why volume is what is the issue. Um, but so, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Al Tosti? Yeah, uh, I guess I'm having a basic problem with why we're doing this. Um, Lyft is a profit-making entity. Um, now, when we, this came before us two years ago, um, we've, we have proper appropriated, I think $20,000 because it was a state grant. And I think this was sold to us as uh, seed money to get this whole pro program going. We're tied in with all the other communities. Uh, and now all of a sudden we were requested for a hundred thousand dollars. And I'm just not sure this is the town of Arlington's responsibility. If Lyft can't make money as a private entity doing this, why are we subsidizing $100,000 of our own money uh, that, that we need in other places for this? Thank you, Al. Um, Brian Beck. Um, Al may just have stolen some of my thunder. I was just having a, a basic plumbing question. Where's the $100,000 going? Is it for the purchase of, uh, of bicycles, of docking stations, of maintenance? Is it going as payments to lift? Or what? what where's the actual $100,000 going? What's, what, 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 what have you budgeted? Dan, can you walk through the three components of what uh, creates the $100,000 request, please? Uh, sure. So, um, it has to do primarily with operations and maintenance of the system, which is a public system. And it comes down to uh, rebalancing the bikes, maintaining the bikes, maintaining the stations. There's also a cost to store the bicycles and stations for the winter. As Jenny mentioned earlier, they get taken up in the winter, the ones that are on street and they put in a warehouse and then they redeploy them in the spring. Um, and then there are also other costs related to relocating the stations if we need to, if there's in the wrong place or there's another issue that we need to relocate it. So there are staff that they have that do all of that. Our town staff does that. And so those are some of the things that we pay for. It doesn't, uh, this isn't for stations or this isn't for purchasing new stations. Thank you, Dan. Uh, John Ellis. Uh, thanks. Um, if we got more stations, would the appropriation still be a hundred thousand dollars? The appropriation would still be one hundred thousand dollars. Yes. And Where our intention is to be able to stretch it over the two years of the contract, and if we can get additional funds through a grant, we could potentially add another station. But there's a lot of variables to potentially doing that. We okay. also want to add a station in Arlington Heights as part of this proposal. So one, one more station and there are, how many did you send it now? Six, eight? Six, right now. Six, okay. And 38 bikes. And what, what do you think is the potential if it's 10,000 rides now, what's the potential for just to, I mean, based on, I don't know, other communities or like, how many rides could we get, get to? With 
one other station or well, with one other station or with, you know, just people changing their habits or, you, you know, better weather. I don't, I don't know, you know, like, do we um, think it's going to be consistently 10,000 or we think over time it's going to be more? I, I, my personal feeling is that it's going to be more. I mean, we were measuring a lot of this is measured during the pandemic which I think is different than looking forward and potentially also looking forward in terms of improvements to Arlington's bicycle, like biking infrastructure to which would accommodate potentially more people wanting to ride a bike. Um, so I, I can see that ridership number increasing and that would of course, that is our goal, has been our goal pretty consistently. But per docking station, I'm not sure I have an exact number. Dan, do you have a sense of what would be a projected amount of ridership growth with what, adding one more station to the system? So the ones, so the stations that are next to the bikeway are doing the best. Last year, the one at the railroad lot and Linwood Street got over two thousand rides um, uh, for the for the year, and um, the one at Magnolia I think also did very well, but also all, along the bikeway. So those ones are frankly doing the best. Um, so the next station, we do have an idea for a place that would be on the bikeway and also on Mass Ave, which we, you know, that would definitely help people get to uh, businesses and uh, important destinations and so on. So, um, so potentially 2000, but we have already seen, um, we have three stations that are all, that are off street that are active this winter and they have uh, basically doubled the amount of rides that this year than the, compared to what we had last year. So getting the stations off street and working all year round is really key to that. Okay. So then it's, if, if, if my math is right and we're at about 10,000 now, and maybe it improves a little bit, we get one more station, then maybe we get be at say 12,500 rides just to make the math easy over two years. So that's 25,000 rides over two years for a hundred thousand dollars. So basically Arlington is subsidizing $4 per bike ride. Is that a fair way to look at this? One way to look at it, yes. Based okay. on that, based on that calculation. If those okay. are the if those are the you know the you know ridership goals. Okay. All right. And I guess then the only other question is, is there any other method in public policy to get people to ride bikes for $4 a ride or three fifty a ride or a dollar a ride. Those are the things that we've been looking at. And also Dan, as a member of that committee, I mentioned, I mean, this is a discussion point for other municipalities as well to try to encourage, you know, an increased ridership. Some of it is being done by blue bikes on their own through their marketing and advertising, reduced cost of, you know, for people who make lower incomes, um, you know, trying to really promote the option, working on it towards as part of transportation demand management goals, uh, which we do as part of some of our special permits that we grant through the redevelopment board. And there's been a variety of ways to promote it, but I think that even more will need to be done to really hit bigger ridership goals in the coming years. Thank okay. you, Jen. Yep. So uh, John, I'd like to, I'm gonna ask a question that's a, sort of a corollary to yours. Um, but Jenny mentioned that, um, you know, there was a difference between the two years because of the pandemic. But in the past we had the green bikes. How many rides did we get with the green bikes? Uh, the line, line bikes, yeah. Lime bikes, um, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I'd have to go back and dig into our line bike data, which was a little is was reported differently to us compared with blue bikes to see what the how the the two stack up. That was a completely different system, as you might recall, where there was a there was actually like a geo fence and limitation in how you could ride it. You didn't have a dock. It was a dockless system. Um, if I, all I wanted to know is how many rides did we have? How many rides total? Um, yeah, in, I'm sorry, offhand, Charlie, I don't know, but I can okay. find out. Unless Dan, do you know offhand? Um, I can only think of right now of fall of 2018, where there's something like 3,000 rides in maybe August and 4,000 in September and another three or so in uh, October. But the difference was also that there was many, many more bikes that were on the ground for that, that program, like 100 or 150. I, I would say that I, I like the line bike financial arrangement 
better. Um, but we were in reality spending the money of a large hedge fund called SoftBank, which was the funder of Limebike, and they were losing money to gain market share. And, and uh, I think those halcyon days are over. So thanks for Thank taking you, my questions. Thank you, John. Sophie? Excuse me. Thank you. And so just to understand, I appreciated Al's comment regarding subsidizing private companies. So, and then the follow-up by Dan. So is the distinction really that what we're providing is a public transportation? It's sort of like the MBTA or whatever, we're, we're sort of funding public transportation. Is that the position? That's the position. We see this as a public good. Happens Thank to you. be provided by a private company. Kayleen. Thank you. Um, as a flu bikes user, I believe it is a public good, but um, that's not my question. I had a quick, if you could quickly address um, in the warrant article, it says to, to also fund a pilot program for uh, income eligible users. I don't need a specific dollar amount, but like, is that a tiny portion of the hundred thousand? Is that a, is that a third of it? And, and just briefly comment on what that means. Could you break down that piece of the funding request, Dan, please, in brief? Uh, so there is an income eligible program that is run by the Blue Lake system. And um, we need to, one of the things we, we should do and we need to do is actually create a uh, location where people can go to sign up for the income eligible system. Um, it may not necessarily mean we need to pay for that. I think you can get a very, very low cost, say annual membership through that income eligible program, but we need to have kind of a place within town where people can go. So that's, I think that would be the main thing is, is determining that and um, making sure that that works right. Thank you. Any other questions um, from the members on this article? Wanda. Hi, so I'm new to this. So I'm having a hard time understanding a little bit about the process, I guess. The warrant is asking for money and the, the FinCom committee is voting whether or not to allow the funding of, the, of this request. You know, the, the, the way this works is the, the, the town meeting will vote or not vote in favor of this article. Mm -hmm. The finance committee will make a recommendation on the article that it, the money should be spent or not. We, and we then the, the article isn't whether or not to have the blue bikes, but whether or not. Well, to... I'm, yeah, that's a question you might ask um, uh, Jenny uh, or Dan, but the, you know, if this article should fail, do we have the blue bikes or not? Is that a question you want to ask? Yeah, I think so. And I, and I guess I wanted to push about the, that this is for commuters because I find it, I don't know, hard to, I, I see this as more of a tourist type activity and a recreation activity and not necessarily even for low income commuters. I think it's kind of expensive for the average person to rent these bikes. But I just, I just wonder how that, if that's the purpose is to ease our transportation system or is it to- what is, So I guess try to try to parse those into a couple of questions that um, they can ask, Wanda. I suppose it, it's, it's that, is this a, is, are we funding a tourist industry? Or how is it specifically good for Arlington to have this and pay for this? As a, like okay. other people said, whether to have this company pay for it themselves or. Jenny? Okay. Um, so I, I think that this, this fulfills a number of the town's goals, including our master plan or Connect Arlington long range transportation plan, which is about sustainable mobility. So providing transportation alternatives, it also fulfills our net zero action plan goals to reduce greenhouse gas 
emissions. So in terms of how it advances things in Arlington, that's just one part of our planning. It also helps our business districts by providing alternative ways for people to get there. But the typical user is not just somebody who's engaged in the tourism economy or anything to that effect, because in fact, the, the communities to the west of us don't actually participate in the, in the program, which is where the, you know, if you were talking about tourism, you'd probably go to the west. This is about commuting. It's also about convenience. It's also about reducing the types of trips that people take in a car to get around the community to do regular activities. So it actually serves multiple purposes. And I think that's probably not even all of them um, and a number of community goals. I know you had other questions baked in there but I hope that answered a couple. Yeah, I think so. I guess it's the Connect Arlington. Do these bikes connect people to Elway, for example? They do, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they connect to the regional transportation network, including rail and other, you know, forms of transportation as well in Somerville, light rail, like the Green Line. So there are other ways that you can use the blue bike system beyond just Arlington. You can connect to Cambridge, Somerville, and beyond Boston, of course, okay. as well as, pick, as Dan pick. noted, uh, you know, the other the ad other additional mm -hmm. municipalities, Newton, et cetera. So you don't so have to return the bike to where you picked it up. No, you don't. It, it just has to go back to a docking station. Otherwise you get a penalty. Okay, okay thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Uh, Grant, give me a second time. Yes, thank you. So what would happen if uh, you didn't get the uh, money on this warrant article? Well, I think it would be very challenging to participate in the next two-year contract with Blue Bikes without some way of paying for operations and maintenance. So we would, if we cannot, if we do not receive this funding, I think we will have to significantly potentially cut back on the number of docking stations. We have been exploring a number of different scenarios, but in all likelihood, the most sort of um, conservative situation would be less docking stations, which would mean less bikes overall in order to be able to continue participating with the amount of money that we currently have and any grant funding that would cover it. But I, I think that that would be it. Thank you, Jenny. You're hey, welcome. Time. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear you say my name. Thanks, Charlie. Sure. Uh, just two quick things. One is that some, um, to want to, to help Wanda out, maybe. Um, some businesses subsidize blue bike memberships for their employees. So uh, one of the companies I used to work for made blue bikes very avail uh, affordable and I was able to utilize them, but we did not have blue bikes in Arlington at that time. So the second point I wanted to make is that um, I do believe having blue bikes throughout the community uh, makes it cuts down on the use of cars, cuts down on, maybe cuts down on the use of the MBTA. It just gives riders another option for how to get around and, um, that it's not as expensive as you might think, given if people have some other discount programs available to them. That's all. Thank you, Shailene. Wanda, is your hand down or up? Okay. Uh, Shane Blundell, I think this is also the second time. Oh, no, first, but thank you, First, Shailene. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Can you, can some, I know, I remember from two years ago, we voted for a sort of a small contribution. Can they, I don't know if this is maybe for, for the planning folks or for, others on the committee, but can somebody just remind me what we, like we approved $20,000 and what was that for and how was, how do we contrast that to, to what we have before us tonight? I can explain, Charlie. Okay. Yes, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, so that it was $200, to, 200, $200, wow, that would be amazing, $200,000 $200, um, to be part of the two-year contract that we are currently in, which expires at the in August, I believe. Um, and as part of that, Lyft actually knocked off $100,000. We received an $80,000 grant from through MassDOT, the Mass Department of Transportation, and we needed $20,000 as sort of a like a mat, a local match. So the structure has changed, as Dan noted, in the negotiations on this committee, some okay, of the I think, conditions I think, have changed. I think that answered the question. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, it did. Thank uh, you. Are there any other questions on this article? Okay, so uh, Grant, third time? 
Yes, sorry. Uh, it's important uh, in, to a degree. So there's going to be a new contract negotiated in August of this year? I think the contract has already been discussed uh, and is being discussed. Dan, can you give an update just timing wise, please? Right. The contract that we're currently in was started or signed on August 2020. So we would need to sign a new contract in August of this year. And so we're working on getting a draft contract from Lyft uh, as we speak. Thank you, Dan. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna close off uh, comment at this point and uh, ask uh, if there's any members that wanna make a motion on this Warren article. I'd like to make a motion. Who said I move that? Uh, Annie LaCourt. Oh, Annie. Okay, make your motion, Annie. I move approval. I move that we 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 vote positive action on the article. Second. Is there a second? Second from John. Um, any discussion on this? Altasi. Grant Altasi first. We are hitting the taxpayer over the head for about $800 a year for a new high school, which I supported because that's a fundamental service that the town of Arlington provides its residents. In about two or three years, we're gonna hit them over the head with the two by four <clears throat> again, because we'll need an override to maintain the basic services of the town. Uh, to, to be able to explain why we need this additional money in two years, when we spend $100,000 to provide a $4 a ride subsidy for a bicycle uh, to, to get to Owl Wife Station, uh, I think it's gonna be really difficult. This is not a fundamental uh, responsibility of the town of Arlington. We gave them seed money to get the stuff going. It's obviously still not making a profit. I, I think it's time to, to uh, not pour any good, more good money after, after bad. Uh, this is gonna be very difficult to explain to the taxpayers. Uh, it, it was uh, a, a lot of these places are taking up parking spaces that we could use. Uh, I know down in East Arlington it is. Um, I, I think we should vote no action on this. Uh, and let the private business either make it profitable or get out of the business. Uh, we subsidize the MBTA because people can't buy their own buses. Uh, people can buy their own bicycles. Uh, you can go down to the police station in April when the uh, police department auctions off their bikes and get them fairly inexpensively. This is not a prime function of the town of Arlington and its government. We should vote this down. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Grant Gibbion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I like bikes. Um, I ride bikes. I think it's great that, you know, everybody else rides bikes. Um, I'm not going to support this because I think that the contract could be better negotiated. Um, other towns get Blue Cross Blue Shield money, but we don't. And I'd be more inclined to support this if I had heard better information about um, what was going on in the negotiations. And it doesn't sound like negotiations in contract. It sounds like they're just gonna tell us what to do. So that's, I would wish that there was a better uh, negotiating uh, structure in place. We asked the art committee for, to, to go ask for additional sponsorships and that's for $5,000. So um, I'd like to see a, 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 something better in the contract before I'd support this article, thank you. Thank you, Grant. Uh, Annie. So what we're fundamentally trying to do here is we're trying to, tra to, tra to change people's habits and choices about transportation to reduce their environmental impact. And it's actually a pretty crucial thing for us to do at the moment. I think it would be out of scope for me to give you the list of reasons, but I think that we're all pretty aware of the direction in which the planet is headed at the moment. We are subsidizing market making at the moment. The hope here is that as habits change, more and more people use blue bikes, 
Lyft will make more and more money on the per ride component of their business model. And we will not be as the institution that is contracting with them responsible any longer for a not per ride component to cover maintenance and operations. We're not subsidizing Lyft. We're not helping out some profit-making company. The profit-making company is only gonna provide the service if they make a profit. We need to contribute this $100,000 for them to make a profit. We're subsidizing our riders. The subsidy will be reduced per ride as ridership increases. And we need to give this a chance because we need to put ourselves on a different trajectory in terms of the uh, increase in uh, climate change that is right now putting us on a pretty deadly trajectory. Any, I think you're getting out of scope. Yeah, well. Thank you, Annie. Any other questions on uh, this article? I have a comment, Charlie. This is Shay. Oh, what happened? You moved on me. <laughs> Shailene. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I, I lost your uh, box here. Oh. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sh Sh Shailene. Thank you. I just want to second what Annie said and add to her comments that we are coming off a pandemic where the number of um, riders was probably depressed and that we should see an increase in ridership. I just wanted to add that to her comments and second what she said. That's all. Thank you, Shailene. Uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, so we'll move this to a vote on Article 60 of Blue Bikes um, as written um, or as proposed for a uh, financial impact of $100,000. Grant Gibeon? Vote oh, no. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Uh, Micaiah Healy? No. Brian Beck? No. Sophie Magliazzo? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Aileen Prokris? Yes. Aileen Crow. Yes. Uh, Daryl Har Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. No. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. No. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. No. David McKenna. Yes. Okay. Um, one, two, three. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven in favor. One, two, three, four, five, six against. So the article is passed. Um, Thank you very much, Jenny and Dan, for your presentations. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, article. Is on warrant article. Uh, uh, subject is warrant article number sixty-five, design, design standards. Jenny Rate. Again, you're busy tonight, Jenny. It's a busy evening for me. Um, design standards. Okay, so this is a fifty thousand dollar appropriation request. Um, it is similar to a request we've made in the past. For um, that I embedded actually in a zoning zoning amendments uh, article request where we used $50,000 to hire a consultant to help us to create residential design standards um, and guidelines for the for single family and two family homes. Um, we currently have commercial and industrial standards that were created in 2014 and 2015 as part of the master plan process. We used an architect, et cetera, you know, similar, slightly similar situation. That was actually funded by capital um, at the time because the master plan was funded through the capital uh, plan. Um, we found, however, that those design standards are less useful than we, uh, than we need them to be, <laughs> much less useful, primarily because there's a lack of precision and sort of applicability to our typical permitting at the redevelopment board level, as well as our review processes. 
Um, I actually invited with me tonight uh, Jean Benson, who is one of the Redevelopment Board members, uh, to join me in helping to answer any questions as well. But um, the board, just to explain, they review architectural plans, you know, physical designs, site plans, other site elements as part of any review process that we conduct. And if we had improved design standards, I think it would help to both uh, guide the board a lot in their decision making and ultimately create better decisions, uh, which is the special permit decision that we provide to applicants to build a better building. Um, as I said, this appropriation amount is exactly the same as a, couple, a few years ago when we hired a consultant to help us form those residential design guidelines. And I would like to do exactly the same thing again, but focused on our commercial areas in the community. Um, so with that, I'll stop and turn it back to you, Charlie. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Jonathan Wallace. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Jenny or Jean, uh, perhaps, you know, for those of us who know nothing about this process, um, you could explain to us what design standards are and what role they play in the process, the permitting process. So the design standards would be, they're essentially a set of standards that say, these are the types of things that we would like to see with a certain type of building. So the redevelopment board reviews buildings that are usually mixed use or commercial, sometimes all residential, but rarely uh, that usually it's just commercial and mix or mixed use. And they would help us to understand how a building might look better on a streetscape, uh, different uh, perhaps building materials or design elements. So um, literally the, the look of the physical look of the building, but also the position of a building on a lot. Um, so literally all elements of design uh, get reviewed by the board and design standards would help to guide both the staff who provide like an, a preliminary memo to the board with you know some that sort of outlines our our suggestions and sometimes recommendations to the board on a particular project that's being reviewed by the board, but then would help guide the board as part of their own deliberations and decision making process. Jean sure. might, if you know it's okay with Charlie, um, add to that as a board okay. member. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I'll, I'll let Charlie. I'll let Charlie decide if if that's okay. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead, Jean. Sorry, and hello, Charlie. Nice to see you. Um, so we have. There are five members on the redevelopment board. And when we had our last retreat, we talked about what we needed to do better and differently. And one of the things came up was that the current uh, design guidelines for commercial buildings weren't really working. I'm not an architect. There are two architects on the redevelopment board and both of them felt we needed new design guidelines to help people who are coming to the board with a proposed building on Mass Ave or Broadway so that the buildings look right and they make sense. And for us to have some way um, to respond to those proposals, we've had some, what I will call very interesting buildings proposed along Mass Ave where we pretty much had to send the developer back to the drawing board for a complete new design. And I think we could speed up that process if they had the design guidelines in place. I will say one other thing though. I don't, they're not intended to say your building must look like X or look like Y or be made of brick or be made of stone. They're, they're, they allow a lot of creativity, a lot of ability of the developers to, to make decisions about what buildings like. I don't think any of us would want all of Mass Ave looking the same. It's the major thoroughfare in the town. One of the nice things about it is the nice melange of buildings that we have throughout uh, Mass Ave. And this would just help in that process. It would speed up, I think, uh, redevelopment activities and just make it smoother and better. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank, thank you both. Uh, Alan Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you sort of summarize what carrots and sticks um, are possible to encourage developers to uh, design according to the design standards? 
Well, the, so the redevelopment board is a special permit granting authority. So a lot of things can happen as part of that process to encourage better design, uh, different positioning of a building. And um, you know that all takes place as part of the special permitting process. It's not really a carrot or stick per se, but it's just in, baked into what is already a, a discretionary permitting process. Um, the design standards are really just that. They're recommended standards for how we want a building, might want a building to look. But as Jean said, a lot of creativity is still um, you know, possible as part of that process. I think that the board, though, if they had those standards, they'd be able to better say with confidence, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're looking at that we would like you to achieve. And then after things, you know, sort of take shape and we have a lot more examples of things getting built according to those standards, I think we'd be able to point to things and say, as that property developer did. So there would become sort of that, that part of the, the process as well. But it, it's not exactly a carrot or stick. It's really just baked into a discretionary permitting process. Well, and, and so it seems like the carrot is you'll get your special permit or not possibly depending if you ignore yeah. the design standards. How, how, uh, in, a, in typical developments in the commercial districts, how many buildings require special permits? Is it like all of them or just some of them? We grant uh, annually, it's been about nine special permits annually. So it's not, uh, you know, that's definitely not all of the types of things that get that happen along the corridor. So some um, buildings are built by right without getting a special permit and, and they and they would and they, they wouldn't have any motivation to adhere by design standards. So. It depends on the building type and the use. Okay, uh, thank you. So yes. Thank you, Alan. Um, Sophie. Um, I, I'm sorry if I missed this bit. So are there currently no written standards that people refer to? I mean, there's no way for somebody to know what you're expecting after the history of the board. The only standards that we have are the ones that were developed as part of the master plan and they're called the commercial and industrial design standards. They're part of the redevelopment boards page. We have, <clears throat> staff have tried to use those standards as well as the board over the last you know, number of years and to very little success. They're not the same as the more recently developed residential design guidelines, which are much more detailed and provide a lot better examples of things that are really more applicable. Um, and we would like to do the same type of thing for the commercial corridor. So no, we don't really have a set of standards right now that we follow. And to Jean's point, we have a couple of architects who are serving on the board right now that has you know, tremendously helped. Um, and we of course have you know, uh, people with some urban design background and you know, uh, design background within the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development staff. But that does not, that's not a good enough, that's not a substitute for having some standards or guidelines. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Al Tassi. Could you uh, give me some examples of what types of standards? I mean, you have a lot. It, you can build up to three floors, uh, you can go to seven and a half feet on each side. What kind of standards do you think this consultant? can give you and why can't they be done by the by the board or the staff of the planning development department? The residential design guidelines that I referenced as being a good model that we would like to emulate were developed by an architect, people with who are registered architects. And we would want or you know also have a specific degree in urban design. While we do have architects serving on the board, I don't know that they're in a position to take on developing a full suite of design standards or guidelines for the entire corridor, I think we would typically hire somebody to perform that activity. The types of standards that we're talking about would cover pretty much all building elements, whether we're talking about adding a coin to a building corner or looking at cer certain types of windows that, you know, for example, the, the board has talked about commercial windows, you know, that we want a certain type of window facing Mass Ave. But we actually don't have a lot of information about the types of windows that we are often referencing or talking about. So we might have design standards that help us to talk about when we're talking with builders, the types of windows that we're looking at, the type then and, and how we want that window to look in a building and on a building. Or if we're talking about, um, you know, you mentioned 
uh, stories and height, we might talk about the massing of the building and the way that we want it to look against the in relationship to the streetscape. The zoning bylaw only does so much of that. It's not, it does not codify design. It just simply tells us what we can and cannot build. That's it. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Uh, Daryl, uh, Al Tassi, is that the end of your questions? Yes. Uh, Daryl Harmer. Um, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Jenny, are there other comparable cities or towns that have um, standards that um, we could emulate or even um, reuse that would, it just seems that we're almost starting from scratch reinventing the wheel here. And it would, I would think that there were other communities that could have standards that we could leverage. There are other communities um, that are similar to Arlington that have design standards. But my experience working into Arlington is that is a very important to pay attention to Arlington and not to necessarily emulate or model after say Somerville or Cambridge, which are neighboring communities that do in fact have design standards. That in fact, we would want to look at and appreciate the sense and spirit of place in Arlington. So, which is what we tried to do with the residential design guidelines. And I think did a really bang up job on that one because we looked at the neighborhoods, we looked at the different conditions, and then we created some you know, recommendations for design standards. We would wanna do exactly the same thing here, but base it on Arlington. Thank you, Jenny. Grant, any other questions? Um, yes, this is my first round on this, this particular uh, one. Um, so you're asking for 50,000 for a consultant um, for the specific design plan. What would 25,000 buy? And also, was this put out to bid uh, or is this just a, a general amount? Oh, no, I haven't put anything out to bid. You mean now? Did I put something out? Yeah, how did you come up with the amount of 50,000? Oh, thank you um, for clarifying that. Um, the $50,000 is based off of the $50,000 that we used to hire the consultant who did the residential design guidelines. So I was using that as my number, that it, it cost that amount to develop those guidelines. So I believe it would cost about the same to develop these guidelines that we're talking about. Um, if we had only 25,000, your other question? I think we would have to reduce the scope um, and we might not do a study. We might just get an architect to give us some you know, prescribed um, sort of scenarios or looking at like sort of past cases, they might be able to give us some guidance and uh, design standards based upon the typical buildings that we review. It would just be a reduced scope of work. Thank you, you know, Jenny. Grant, did you have any other questions? No, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Carmen. I, I think I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, do you think these standards will encourage or discourage or have no impact on um, people's willingness or desire to do commercial development in Arlington? Have no impact. So why do we care about this? Because we care about good design in the community. From what I've experienced, um, when you build a building that nobody likes, you hear a lot. You hear a lot about it, um, and I think that the board would like to develop buildings, especially buildings that are going to last for a very long time, in a way that is uh, pleasing within Arlington, and that's what we're interested in doing. So it does have a lasting effect. I don't think anybody is opposed to that, including the people who come before the board. They actually are often looking for that kind of, that level of guidance and like to Jean's point earlier on in the process rather than later. So I think it would be beneficial to many people in that way. Thank you, Jenny. Dean, do you have another question? Dean, do you have another yeah, question? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of confused by the answer. Um, so, you're, so you're basically saying that commercial developers who are building to make money don't build buildings that people want, but so the town officials are gonna do it? I don't understand that. I don't understand your response. Like I build, I, I deal with design plans for restaurants all the time. And trust me, I build things people want. Like 
I, because if no one wants to walk in there, you don't make any money. So are you saying that the government understands how to make money for commercial business, but residents like businesses don't, I don't understand. I was saying the book Gene is raising his hand. I'll let Gene take a stab at it, but I was not saying that exactly. So Gene, please. Yeah, let, yeah let me try to say it as, as sort of somebody who's been on the redevelopment board. While clearly somebody proposing a building wants to make money about it, they're not necessarily concerned with does the outside of the building work for the town of Arlington? Do we want to have a building that looks like that on our main thoroughfare in Arlington or not? They're basically concerned, as, as you said, with can they make money on the building? We have a different concern, which is, is this something that should be on our main thoroughfare, let's say Mass Ave, in Arlington? And one of our charges is how does it fit in with the streetscape? How will it work with the streetscape? How will it help um, the whole business district up and down Mass Avenue? And um, the way to do that is to give them some guidance. I think it will actually make it easier for some of them because they won't have to come before us and have you know, the redevelopment board say, look, this is just not an acceptable design for the outside of the, bu the building for these particular reasons. If they have the guidance ahead of time, they're gonna have a head start on getting the building done and the building approved. Thank you, Gene. Dean, did that answer your question? You're good, okay. okay. Yeah, Alan Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a very specific example of what might happen. There are the, the two three-story buildings between the high school and Stop and Shop. And I think they are, no one thinks that they are appropriate there. Somehow they got built, they're terribly ugly. Um, would having published approved design standards have resulted in a better product for those spaces? So the, one of those buildings is actually fully constructed and occupied, and the other one is under construction. You can and tell it's going to be just as ugly. That, that is uh, out for full, uh, open for uh, subject to opinion by the public. But with that said, I will say that that second building that is not yet completed, so we don't know exactly what it will look like, actually went through multiple design iterations, and I think is actually a pretty good example of where design standards would have been a huge help to both that uh, developer as well as the board. The developer's original proposal changed quite a bit over the course of time, but only after a lot of pains of going through the board's review process um, and many months of that back and forth with the board. I think if we had had design standards, it probably would have been a lot more straightforward about what the board was asking and looking for, but also would have provided that model uh, to the developer as to exactly what we were asking for, rather than a lot of back and forth and um, you know multiple meetings with the board to get it right, which ultimately the board approved unanimously um, and permitted it through the environmental design review process. But so that's I a think case that's actually that is a good example of where it would have been beneficial. Okay, well the developer actually might have appreciated design standards. And it would have, design standards it would have been appreciated. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, are there any other questions on uh, Article 65? Oh, Sophie. Alan, could you put your hand, please? So I'm just trying to think through this for a second. My experience, I'm thinking of the historical uh, commission when we live in a historical district and we go before them, they don't have design standards written out, right? And, and people go multiple times before them, is that sort of, I mean, I don't do commercial work. So in, in my experience in the residential, that's what I do. Is that what you're trying to avoid is having people go multiple times before them? And, and if so, I mean, are we saying that the historical commission would need to also- uh, I think that's a little beyond the scope of this article. We're talking about commercial buildings on Mass Ave, Sophie. Right. but. You can, can, can the redevelopment board do its job of um, enforcing the standards it wants without these, 
is I guess my question. Without what? Can, can the redevelopment board do its job and enforce a design standard without having them pre-written by a consultant? Um, Jenny? I, so the, the, first of all, there's the historical commission and there's the historic districts district commission. Okay, so that the, the districts actually do have design stand, design guidelines. Um, the, com, the historical commission does not, just to give you the, the difference between those two. So if you were in an historic district, actually you do have to abide by their design uh, guidelines in order yeah, to we're get- talking, to we're talking about commercial, not Sorry, residents. you're right. Let's get back <laughs> stay, to commercial. I'll stay on task, okay. Um, just wanted to give that nuance. So I, yes, I think that the, the I, you know, basically the standards would be helpful regardless of whatever the process is, but also they can be enforced by the board as part of a special permit. That's the special permit that is granted is the way in which we enforce the standards in, a, in any process. Thank Sorry, you. I just wanted to provide that clarity. Grant, second time. Yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, second time. Um, I'm reminded of the presentation we had earlier by uh, Mr. Schlickman. Um, makes me kind of wonder, well, what's uh, the use? Grant, we that's not, we're not talking about that. Just ask well, the question about this sure. part. Okay. We can't stop um, businesses from putting large signs in their windows. Sorry, I have to I'm not, not sure. Grant, I'm not Grant, sure Grant please. Please, this is not the subject. Not what's the enforcement? If you want to ask about enforcement on design standards, that's fine, but it has nothing to do with signs. Uh, okay, it's, I think it's in perspective of how enforcement's done. What is the in, in special permits? Um, how many special permits have been turned down in the last two or three years? One. <laughs> All right, thank I you. I mentioned that there were nine, about roughly nine annually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other question uh, on uh, this article? Okay, hearing none, I have one question. Um, and, th and that is this $50,000 is a one-time cost. And we're not gonna see a request for it next year or the year after. Correct, <clears throat> on, both, on both accounts, yes. Thank you. So a motion on uh, article, on more in article 65 is in order. Does someone wanna make a motion for or against this article? So moved, Charlie. Second. That was jo Jonathan. That it was me, yes. Okay, so Jonathan has moved favorable action on Warren Article 65, uh, $50,000 for design standards. Uh, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any further uh, discussion? Yes. Their chance to make, when does one make a substitute motion? This is the time. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, uh, make the amount of 25,000. Is there a second? There's no second, so it doesn't stand. I got it. So um, any other discussion questions? All right, so we'll go to a vote on um, Article 65. Grant Gibbon? No. Shane Blundell? No. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? No. Brian Beck? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Abstain. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Shailene Crawford? No. Daryl Harmer? No. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. No. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. No. And David McKenna. Yes. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine in the affirmative. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the negative, and uh, one abstention. So the um, the uh, article is approved. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you, Jean. Appreciate your time this evening. So uh, we're running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, we have some members of the Commission for uh, Arts and Culture here. Mis Mr. Uh, Pot Tozicki. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did, did I say that right, Pot Pot Tozicki? Yeah, right enough. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I say Poltozicki, but so uh, Poltozicki. Okay, that's that's better. Poltozicki. Close enough. Right. You know, it's. Uh, Yes, so thanks. Um, and I am uh, joined today by uh, two colleagues, uh, my co-chair Stuart Ikeda and the treasurer of the commission, uh, Kristen Bagnall. Um, I'd like them to take just a moment to introduce themselves because they'll be helping answer any questions that you may have, but I'll be ready. Right, go right ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, Kristen Canterbury Bagnall. Uh, as Steve said, treasurer of ACAC, I'm glad to be with you again this evening. Thank you for coming. And, and the other colleague is? I'm Stuart E. Keda, and uh, I'm co-chair with Steve this year. And um, yeah, it's it's fascinating to see you guys work. And uh, we're glad to be back. Wonderful. Thank so, you. So I have a presentation. Um, and if... Um, Who's, are you, who has the presentation? May I oh, share screen? Yeah. Yes. By all means, Sarah, can you enable screen sharing for Kristen? They should be enabled. Okay. Super. Thanks for that. So, um, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, our the main focus. Uh, we'll, no, just stay on the, the first one if you don't mind, Kristen. Uh, the main focus will be on the numbers um, but uh, and what they represent. But we also want to get just a little bit into the context. Uh, you know, we're before you only once a year, memories fade, and there may be uh, new members of um, the Finance Committee. Uh, so just very quickly run through some little bit of context. Ne next slide, Chris. Um, so, you know, several years ago, town government, uh, including FinCom, um, asked that the various uh, town affiliated um, arts and culture committees and groups be consolidated under one roof. Uh, so that'd be just one organization to deal with, one organization to fund. Uh, and that was done. Uh, it became uh, ACAC, Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture. Uh, so some of the pre existing uh, constituent organizations are shown here. Uh, and, and several of them have been uh, separately funded um, by the town. Uh, and also we have representatives from a number of other town constituencies. So, which is really to make the point that we're not just an arts and culture silo. Next slide. Um, so you know, uh, what we do flows from what is important to the town as, as we understand it. There's the master plan, which was created in, 2015, which acknowledged that public art attracts visitors and business patrons and helps draw the community together. Uh, then there was an arts and culture plan that was approved by the select board in 2017, where it indicated uh, the mission ought to be to strengthen and grow arts and cultural opportunities in Arlington, thriving arts and cultural life for all. And um, that's what, uh, what we take to heart. Um, which is that we believe that arts and culture are a differentiating asset for the town, uh, which creates opportunities for economic growth. Um, it attracts people to live in the, in the town, raises the quality of life for the residents. Um, and this is an asset that we are uh, committed to, uh, to growing. Next slide. So there have been some studies that show what the impact of arts and culture is uh, on a local economy. Uh, for example, there's one study that shows for every dollar spent, um, there's, uh, it generates uh, $2.30 worth of sales for uh, nearby businesses, which is, I guess, some substantial leverage. And then people who come to arts, and, uh, arts events uh, spend over $30 beyond the cost of 
admission um, uh, for for local uh, for local businesses. So this is just one one factor among many, but it's um, you know people have looked into this and uh, it's uh, it's a money maker. Next page. So um, we have taken to heart the uh, the. Uh, the goal of uh, helping establish Arlington as a cultural destination. And there are a number of things that we've been doing to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, first of all, we've been promoting uh, Arlington as a cultural destination. Uh, one of the things is that we just recently uh, created um, a professionally produced uh, audio tour of uh, the cultural district, which is essentially um, the uh, geographical uh, space between Arlington Center and roughly the Capitol Theater uh, in, East Arlington, in East Arlington. Uh, and we have uh, a local historian, uh, Ed Gordon, who's the director of the Ulshaw Mill. He's the leads people through this audio tour and, and talks about the various historical and cultural highlights. Um, so, you know, very proud of that. Um, the, uh, the Chamber's uh, recent uh, magazine, uh, Visit Arlington, which went out to a number of residents, but also to people in surrounding towns. 63% of the content of that is focused on arts and culture because that's one of the things that's a draw uh, to the town. Uh, over half the hits on our website of traffic come from outside of Arlington and a number of media mentions. Um, in turn, and so, that's the promotion part of it. But we also, there's meat and potatoes, there are events. Um, we've had uh, over a dozen outdoor performances and we're, now we're talking about the, this current fiscal year, fiscal year 2022. Um, in, in the Heights, there was a, a project called uh, Neighborhood Haiku uh, where um, haiku poems were solicited from the community uh, and then local uh, artists uh, uh, painted the words of the poem and illustrations uh, for the poems on uh, around 25 or 30 shops in Arlington Center. There was an opening celebration, over 300 people came, they visited all the shops, then hundreds came after that to check out the various uh, storefronts. And it was, it was a big deal. It was very well received by the store owners, very well received by the neighborhood. Just an example of the kind of event that, that you know, brings people in from both uh, uh, in town, but also from out of town to check it out because it, it was a very well done, uh, a very big deal. Um, the Arlington Center for the Arts, which is uh, one of our sort of um, uh, organizations that are, I wouldn't say not part of us, but affiliated, uh, the Open Studios Porch Fest, over 1,500 participants, and one of our uh, fundraisers called Cheerful Where You Sit, which, uh, draw, which drew hundreds of folks to come and bid on these uh, artistically designed chairs and so on. Those are events um, and performances. The, and also you may be familiar with some of the uh, uh, art that's uh, you know, outdoors. Uh, there was a major pro uh, uh, project called Reflections on Our Pandemic Experience where one of our local artists drew uh, sketches every day during um, the pandemic and then uh, turned those sketches into flags or banners which were then uh, about a hundred of them were displayed uh, around in trees in um, Manami Rocks Park and then another 50 or so at the Kingstand, Kingstand Cafe. Uh, and you, you all may have seen the painted utility boxes, the recycled doors along the bikeway, the youth banners, the uh, Black History Month banners, a uh, major project now involving uh, high school interns is Remembers of Climate Futures which asks them to think ahead uh, um, to what life will be like in, you know, down the road, let's say in 2050, and sort of track what Arlington may have done in response to uh, climate change over the years. Um, we have a project by an artist in residence who is creating portraits of uh, uh, members of the, Black members of the Arlington community, uh, and a number of other uh, projects along the bikeway. So, um, is essentially when, when COVID hit, um, it, was, it was thought that we'd have to scale back on our, on our activities, uh, but if anything, our activities have incre increased. Um, and it's all to meet the needs of town residents um, and visitors who are essentially hungry for the, I guess, the spiritual uplift that uh, arts and culture can give. Um, so, and, and it 
it all relates here to the making Arlington a cultural destination. So it's, it's about dollars, but it's not just dollars. Next slide. So uh, speaking of dollars, um, it's by the way, Kristen, I can't read on my screen the, the bottom most part of the, the slides. I don't know if anyone else is, yeah, that's okay. Um, so um, again, speaking of dollars, we leverage uh, the funds that the town provides us. And just by way of a reminder, uh, this current fiscal year, we were funded at the $30,000 level. Um, we leverage the funds uh, the town provides uh, and we raise a significant amount on top of that. The, the numbers on this chart do not reflect the town funds. They, re they reflect everything that we raise on top of that. Uh, and so this year, our, our budget is around uh, $103,000 uh, on top of uh, the town funding. We have raised um, uh, the bulk of that already and the rest, the rest of it is pledged. Um, so we're essentially at our, um, at our budget. Uh, in terms of revenue budget uh, already. So two thirds of the year have gone by and we're, we're almost at 100% of a revenue target. Um, and the town funds only comprise uh, about 23% of our overall uh, revenue budget. Uh, but it's important to understand that the town funds help us raise all this other money, whether it's because uh, of the need to have matching funds um, or whether it's because, and a lot of what we raise is through um, foundations and, and other sources of grants. Some of those don't like to cover certain kinds of expenses like overhead and so on. And we use the town funds to cover those, those, those kinds of expenses. Next page. Uh, this is just to show that we're not siloed, uh, that we work with a number of town departments, a number of committees, um, nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations, a whole bunch of them. We, we work in the realm I mentioned before, education, for example, with the, uh, the high school interns working on a climate futures project. We work in the realm of public health with that, um, uh, that ba those banner flags that relate to the reflections on the pandemic experience. We work in the DEI sphere with the uh, portraits of Black Arlington uh, residents uh, and, and an economic development in terms of the performances, the parklet beautification, uh, the, the cultural district uh, audio tour. So we're woven into the fabric of what goes on in town and also regionally. Next page. Uh, but don't just take our word for it uh, because we have a number of uh, letters and memos of support. Um, that show the kind of value that uh, we deliver to the community. It's uh, numerous testimonials showing how we boost the local economy, how we enrich the cultural lives of the community and how we help these, uh, some of these other town organizations deliver on their own missions of doing good in the community. Um, and I think you, you've uh, also sort of highlighted the a uh, couple of uh, you know, select board members, also the town manager sent a, a memo uh, supporting um, our budget request. Next page. So the numbers. Um, so um, our revenue sources um, include a heavy dose of grants, uh, both in this, which shows both our budget and what's been raised so far uh, year to date. Um, it's, uh, and, and grants, comprise a lot of what's already been raised in pledge, but also a respectful amount of individual donations and amounts raised from, from businesses. And we can sort of get into the details of, of these things, uh, if you like, as to why things are shaping up uh, the way they're shaping. Uh, we've mentioned the sort of the leverage the, the town funding gives us in, in raising uh, the other funds that are needed for uh, operations. But one more point on that is, that um, the, the town funding gives us sort of, sort of the necessary stability to be able to ensure that we can uh, work with our contractors and projects that carry over from one year to another. So there's a certain uh, uh, base level of funding that is helpful for that purpose. Uh, most of what we spend goes for programs or programming. Um, it's uh, you know the art exhibits, uh, the performances, and the events that are sort of highly valued for the, for the community. Um, so this is the situation sort of year to date. Uh, next slide. Um, what we're proposing for um, fiscal year 2023 is funding at the $35,000 level. 
Um, $35,000 is what we had received in fiscal year um, 2020. It was what had been allocated in fiscal year 2021. Uh, but that's when COVID hit, um, sort of early that calendar year. Uh, it was decided that um, we'd, we'd be, we'd, because it was thought that our activity was scaled back, our funding was scaled back uh, $5,000. But as we mentioned, uh, our activities did not uh, in fact scale back. And so what we're asking now is that after having lived at the $30,000 level now for two fiscal years, that it be restored to the $35,000 level, essentially as it was before um, the pandemic hit. Um, and what we're planning is that uh, in this upcoming fiscal year, we'll continue to be putting on those kind of performances that bring uh, visitors into town. Um, we're gonna commission art to be enjoyed by the public that'll be be enjoyed uh, mostly out of doors. Um, and we're gonna present other, other kinds of programming. We'll get the community involved in, in the types of creativity um, that's embodied in arts and culture. Next slide. And for the succeeding fiscal years, um, at uh, which I guess I should have said 2024 or 2025, um, we're asking for a level that was originally provided. Um, fiscal year 2021, I had $35,000 and it just plays out, um, you know, town funding and also what are our assumptions as to other sources of funding. We expect, you know, we got a, arguably we got a bump up um, uh, last year in terms of um, COVID relief kinds of funds uh, from uh, grant making organizations. So we still think our fundraising uh, uh, activities are strong. We have uh, strong, and experienced people who are dedicated uh, to this. We have a good fundraising committee and I think we'll be able to continue on uh, along this trajectory. And we hope to continue to incrementally increase the kinds of programs that um, you know, the town enjoys. So we'll take your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, for a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> so are there any questions for the Council, the Arts and Culture Council, for Stuart or for for uh, Steve. Hands up, Brian Beck. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. Um, I'm not sure that uh, this is relevant to us per se, but how much cash do you have uh, currently on hand? And separately, um, your expenses seem to be. Um, running a little bit less than what you had budgeted. Do you anticipate uh, higher expenses in the next coming months or what do you expect as far as that's concerned? Sure. Kristen can chime in on this one because I think uh, she knows the answers. Yes, uh, so we have, we have about $50,000 on hand. And as you see, we have significant grants pledged that aren't in yet. Uh, and the answer to the question about how our expenses run through the year. So we have two things. One is we have substantial activity in the fourth quarter because we are to some degree, especially during COVID seasonal, we've been running primarily outdoor activities. So we spend the bulk of our, we make the bulk of our program expenditures in the fourth quarter. We also have um, a number of program, a number of expense lines that are the work is done throughout the year, but the contractor or um, entity is paid once. So for instance, Arts Boston, we have a license with them to use their calendar to feed our website so that any arts activity in Arlington feeds through our website. We pay them once a year in the fourth quarter, but we use the calendar all year. So for those two reasons, more of our money is expended fourth quarter. And we do expend to, we do expect to fully spend our, um, what we budgeted this year. Thank you, Kristen. Um, any other questions at this point? That must have been a pretty spectacular, oh, there we go. I was gonna say it was a spectacular presentation, but it looks like you got another question here. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just, you know, being what I do, I see the website going 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, and then 3,000, 3,000, and what, what happened there? Uh, so the web... story question. <laughs> Actually, I can, oh, okay. I can take that if it's helpful. Um, so the website has been at 3,000 for a number of years. 
Um, the website is now Stuart, four years old, five years old. About um, that. Yeah. So we're planning a significant rebuild in FY23. So maintenance has been around three set threat three thousand every year. We're doing um, substantial work on it in 23, and then we'll return to maintenance. Stuart, is there anything you want to add? Uh, simply that we've we have greatly expanded all of our communications um, channels. So the needs the, the our needs for uh, strong web development and support have grown as we have grown. So we've now uh, added you know, you know the hosting for the audio tour. We've spun off you know podcast channels. We've you know ex expanded. Um, the the kind of interactive components of the cultural district uh, map and tour, um, and so our hosting needs have changed. Um, our constituencies have continued to grow, so we've added several new features to uh, the website, um, and our and and the other thing is our, our security needs um, dictate that we. Um, are looking to find more, a new hosting environment and uh, develop some new features. So that's that's the plan. There's a, a multi-year kind of development project for the website. Okay, so the 10,000 is an upgrade and then back to the 3,000 for maintenance. Yeah. For annual maintenance, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Al Tosti. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there's no other questions, I'd like to make a motion. Um, let's find out if there are any, no other questions first. Are there any other questions for the, yes. Go ahead, Al. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we appropriate or recommend uh, the 35,000 to the Arts and Culture Council. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further uh, discussion? I, I just wanted to add that uh, two years ago when we were entering the pandemic, uh, and we had no idea what was going to be happening to the town's financing. Uh, I went to the council and I said, we really need to cut back. Uh, I, I, I'd like you're okay to cut back from 35 to 30. And, and the council said, we understand uh, and uh, agreed to the cutback. Uh, and they said, hopefully we could get it back in the, in the future. So I wanted to thank them for their cooperation and your predecessors at that point and think you're doing a great job in uh, in raising money uh, for your projects from other sources. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Al. Sophie? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I might miss some of the discussion. My computer shut off. Um, and I appreciate, I just popped back in when Al made the motion. So um, I appreciate that because I do have a, a question or question for the committee, other committee members having been new and specifically Al. Um, in 2019 at the town meeting, I had asked about the, the increases because before 2019, the amounts uh, arts were 5,000 and then 15,000, I think. And it bumped up to 40,000. And Al, I think you explained that it was that 40,000 in 2019, it was supposed to be seed money. Um, and that you expected that it would go down in future years. So now I'm seeing it hasn't gone down, but it sounds like you're okay with that. So I'm, I just wanna make sure I understand sort of the history of going up to 40, thinking it was going back down, but actually now it's staying there and it's okay now. Well, it's not at 40. I, I think the finance committee didn't see, want to see at the time that this is a town funded program uh, that would continue to go up, that we saw it as seed money. Uh, I think the council has gone out and uh, uh, raised a great deal of money as they've demonstrated um, and, re and really helped themselves. So I think uh, continuing to fund at a slightly lower level than it was uh, at 35,000 seems very reasonable to me. Thank you. Any, any further questions? Or comments on, on the uh, Arts and Culture Council. Okay, we'll move to a vote uh, for thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. Grant Gibbion. Vote yes. 
Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Micaiah Healy. Yes. Uh, Brian Beck. Yes. Sophie McDazzle. Yes. Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Shailene Corford. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Coser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Juan de Nascimento. I'm sorry, Al Tosti. Yes. Juan de Nascimento. Yes. Uh, Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Uh, the the uh, thirty five thousand dollars is supported unanimously. Uh, thank thank you for a great presentation, good information, and um, congratulations on your continued success. Thank you. We appreciate your, your, the time and, and the thoughtfulness that you put into this request. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has turned into a really a wonderful relationship coming back here every year and, and meeting with you. We really appreciate your support. And, and we really like it when it's the same number. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a um, great night. Thank you. You too. So we're at 9.52. Is there any uh, business that we haven't attended to in the past that uh, has been hanging over that anybody wants to address? Okay. Um, any new business? I, I've, I've sort of given you a heads up on the business coming up next Monday. Any other things that are going to be popping up? No. Okay. So in this case, I think um, it's it's about seven minutes before the hour, but it might be appropriate. I, by the way, I just want to say that um, I appreciate the um, thoughtful discussion and uh, debate tonight by all of the members on these various issues. I think um, I, I you know I think the uh, the analyses and the questions uh, and the comments were. Um, very uh, both high level relevant. So uh, I think a motion to adjourn is in order. Move to move adjourn. Second. 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 Moved and second. If there's no objection, we'll unanimously adjourn. No objection. Adjourned. Thank you. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night.